Welcome back. Chapter 25 centers on Don Quixote's decision to do penance in the Sierra Morena. The immediate question, what did our gentleman do to believe he has to do penance? As we shall see, Sancho has the same question. Perhaps there are clues to an answer in the chapter's details. Early on, Sancho complains about the fact that his master has commanded him to be silent. He expresses his desire to return home because there at least he can speak all I wish. He even brings his ass into play, saying that if animals could speak as they spoke in the time of Aesop, then this would be bearable, because at least I could converse with my ass about whatever I wanted. When Don Quixote lifts the ban, Sancho cuts to the chase. What was it that caused your worship to jump to the defense of that Queen Magimasa, or whatever her name is? And why should it matter whether or not that abbot was her lover? For there was no reason at all to pay attention to the words of a madman. To this, Don Quixote replies that he did so because he knows how honored and how respectable the Lady Queen Madasima was, and that moreover, she was also very prudent and long-suffering in her calamities, adding that all knights are obliged to come to the defense of the honor of women, no matter who they are. After Sancho unleashes an hilarious series of inconsistent refrains, Don Quixote again censors his squire. What do all these sayings you string together have to do with what we are discussing? By your life, Sancho, shut up and henceforth attend to spurring your ass and stop butting into what does not concern you. Wait, what ass is Don Quixote referring to? Then when Sancho says it makes no sense to go looking for a madman who will simply do them more harm, Don Quixote informs the squire that he has something else in mind. I'll have you know that beyond finding the madman in these parts, I am more drawn to this region because of a desire that I have to perform a great deed. What deed? Don Quixote plans on imitating the great Amadis of Gaul, who was one of the most perfect knights, even more he was all by himself, the greatest, the one and only, the lord of all who were knights during his time in the world. Here we have the Renaissance theme of exemplarity. A major moral political strategy of the humanists was to cite examples from medieval, classical, or religious history as modes of appropriate behavior or virtue which should be imitated by their students, particularly the princes and nobles at the courts of Western Europe. Interestingly, around the middle of the 16th century, courts in countries like Spain, England, and France began to look increasingly to the fictional heroes of the romances of chivalry as their favorite examples. Note the precision with which Don Quixote embodies this new preference, for he claims that equal to, or even better than, classical heroes like Homer's Odysseus or Virgil's Aeneas, Amadis was the North Star, the Morning Star, the son of all valiant and enamored knights to be imitated by all of us who crusade under the banner of love and chivalry. Notice the specificity of what Don Quixote will imitate. He is not interested in the epic military feats of Amadis, such as cutting giants in half, beheading snakes, slaying dragons, laying waste to armies, thwarting fleets, etc but rather his act of atonement in the name of love when he retired scorned by Lady Oriana to do penance on the mournful mountain, changing his name to that of Beltenbros. When Sancho still misses the point, what does your worship wish to do in this remote place? Don Quixote supplements the example of Amadis with that of Roland, but again, not the bloody soldier in the French epic, but the lost lover in Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. I want to imitate Amadis, playing here the part of the desperate one, the fool and the madman, by imitating as well the valiant Don Roland, when by a stream he found signs that Angelica, the beautiful, had committed vile acts with Medoro. This allusion to Angelica's sexual disloyalty with a young Moor goes directly to the issue of racial purity that we have been highlighting. Coupled with the fact that Don Quixote wants to do penance in an especially emotional way, not by performing mad acts that cause damage, but rather acts of sorrow and feeling, the knight stresses again that sexual miscegenation is at the root of all the violent follies of the Sierra Morena. In case we do not grasp this, Sancho asks his master, 
What signs have you found to make you believe that my lady Dulcinea del Toboso has done something foolish with either Moor or Christian? And here's the point, according to Don Quixote, the object is to go insane without cause and to convey to my lady that if I am prepared to do this on a clear day, what would I not do in the rain? Sancho, my friend, don't waste your breath advising me to leave off such a rare, happy, and never seen imitation. I am mad and mad I must remain. Insane logic is always difficult to understand, but note that the knight values his act of penance far above any infidelity on the part of his beloved. At this point, Sancho draws a parallel between Don Quixote's amorous madness and his belief that a barber's basin is the helmet of Mambrino. He even sneaks in his opinion on the matter. I have the basin in my bag, all dented, and I am taking it home to repair it and shave my beard in it. What? But I thought the student already smashed the helmet of Mambrino to pieces. Either way, we should not be surprised that master and squire once again debate the reality of things, with Don Quixote taking the relativist position. What you take to be a barber's basin strikes me as the helmet of Mambrino, and it will appear to be something else to someone else. There's even a scatological slip by our Hidalgo when he says that others might see a bedpan, but they do not know its true value.